Dr. Lisa, welcome to the Dad Edge Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm excited to have you on. Well, first of all, as we were kind of joking before the uh, for the podcast, as we even started here, is that I don't have I don't have girls. <laughs> it's I okay. Four boys, but I have seen your book and your name mentioned so many times in in our community here, as of recently, especially. Uh, and I just we just felt compelled to have you on. So I'm so excited to have you on. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I will tell you, even though Untangled centers on girls. I hear all the time that 80% of it applies to boys as well, which I think really? is true. Yes. Oh, awesome. Yes. Yes. It's very, very much cool. about adolescence and how it unfolds. Um, and that is, you know, equally true for boys and girls in terms of the stages I lay out. Well, let's go there. But before we do that, uh, I would love to hear what what does your family look like? So I have two daughters. One is a freshman in college and the other is a sixth grader. And I'm married. My husband is a teacher. Um, and so he is with teenage boys all day. I practice a lot with adolescents, both girls and boys, a little bit more with girls. So we're very much oriented around kids and family life and, you know, doing that at home and at work. Very cool. Well, how about before we get started with adolescents and raising daughters and even how it pertains to boys, how about a few fun questions first, just to kind of warm sure. up. All right, cool. Sure. What is something you like to do outside of your practice and writing and being a mom and a wife? So this is going to sound really boring, but I'm pretty devoted to it. I'm actually a pretty serious knitter, which is kind of, a, you know, it's not exciting. It's not exciting. But I um, I started knitting. I taught myself right after college. And I think especially because the projects I work on are so long term, you know, books take a long time. Um, you know, caring for people and helping people get better takes a long time. You can't always see the progress. For me, there's something very comforting about like, I made this hat, I made these mittens. <laughs> and I also, I have a very strong creative streak. And so designing actually is something I quite love. So um, that's probably my main hobby um, besides exercise, walking and talking to my friends. Is is there something about knitting that just allows you to kind of maybe go into a relaxing sort of flow state where you can just sort of think the way you want to or reflect on things or and and also it's like the whole creative aspect too. It's like you're you're making something either beautiful or you're creating something that hasn't been created. Is it something like that? I think it is. I, I usually do it while I'm watching TV. So I, I I'm not usually I, I've done it so long that I can do it pretty automatically and don't have to look at it. But there is something about um, making something beautiful. Like I, I think that we don't talk enough about um, the pleasure of looking at beautiful things. I, I really do think design is actually a very, very powerful part of our lives, far more than we talk about. And um, and I like doing it for gifts. Um, I just turned 52 not long ago, and a lot of my friends are sort of turning 50, 51. And so I've been giving very, very elaborate mittens as 50th birthday gifts to all of my women friends. And it's it's just been a nice way to sort of honor a big birthday, but not with something that's costly, but something that's very personal. So that's what yeah. I do. Something that you made. I mean, yeah. you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty cool. My my wife, because I, I actually love to cut our lawn. Like I love it. <laughs> yeah. And my wife is like, why don't you just pay somebody to do it? I was like, for me, it's so therapeutic because I'm making something look more beautiful than what it was. And it just allows me to get some exercise and it allows me just to not do something like that, yep. that requires a whole lot. In fact, I, it's very therapeutic. So I get to think a lot while I'm doing it. Yep. So I definitely get that. Uh, how about when, so growing up, mm -hmm. what is a favorite childhood memory that you have? You know, it's interesting. I, I loved being a teenager and I think that's why I work on adolescence and my experience growing up, our family life, we were, I was an only child. I'm an only child. And um, didn't my folks worked very hard. I was, I was sort of a latchkey kid. I didn't do a lot of stuff after school. And for me, when I became a teenager, it's like when my world like went from black and white to color. Like I was out with my friends. I got a car that I bought myself from a job I had as a bus girl. And um, it's when everything opened up and became really fun. So like for me, my favorite memories of growing up I grew up in Colorado. We're skiing with my friends. We um, would take our really kind of crappy cars that we probably should not have been driving in the mountains. We would take them up to the mountains. We would ski all day. We would wipe ourselves out. We would listen to music on the way up. We would listen to music on the way back. That that for me um, was vibrant then, remains vibrant now. 
And I think it's part of why I work on adolescence now is that I have very fond memories of that time. See it as a time of huge potential. See it as a very rich time of life. Um, so that for me is really where things got interesting when I was a kid. That is really cool. You know, I always love hearing not only things about, you know, our guests that are personal or are meaningful to them, but also what you really just laid out was this really cool origin story of why you mm -hmm. maybe you started doing this work in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'd really love to start out with, um, you know, men who, and we're speaking obviously to mostly men, mm -hmm. but uh, there's just, what I've noticed is there's just a special place in the heart of a man for his daughter. Right. And I know for a daughter, you know, there's a special place in her for him, mm -hmm. but I've also seen through our community and through men that we've worked with that it's, it's when, you know, that, that preteen sort of stage, that tween stage is, is that, that that's when it seems like some disconnection comes or some mm -hmm. frustration comes, or I don't really know what to do. It's like this, this really, this, this ground of uncertainty for, for dads in particular. And I'm, I'm curious, what do you think, what is that? Well, so it's, I, I'm so glad we're having this conversation and I'm, I'm so glad this is an audience of dads because one of the things I have found about Untangled is that my most ardent fans of the book are dads. And um, I have wild stories. There's a dad in LA who carries a case of Untangled in his car and every time he meets a man who has a daughter, he's like, you need to read this book, right? So, and I have like all these stories like that. And I've thought a lot, like, what is it about that book and dads? Because moms like the book. Like there's plenty of moms who have good feelings about the book, but there's something different around dads. And so here's my theory, right? And this gets to your question. So I think that when a dad has a daughter, the day she comes home, you know, from the hospital or when she comes into the home, they are so devoted and they're like, this is going to be my girl and we're going to be best buds and I'm going to take care of this girl and we're just going to, you know, I'm going to give her everything I've got and protect her all the way. And that goes great for 10 years because from zero to 10, girls are all in on that. Like they love hanging out with their parents. They can especially enjoy their dad sometimes. And everything's going great. And the dad's like, this is awesome. We are best friends. I'm going to get you through adolescence as your very best friend. Like, this is going to be awesome. And then 11 comes around the corner and adolescence begins much earlier than anybody expects. But that's when adolescence begins. And teenage girls and also teenage boys do what they do, which is they suddenly become more private. They retreat their, to their rooms. They don't think we're as funny as we they used to think we were. They don't want to do the things we want to do. And I think for moms, they remember this. They're like, oh, I remember when I did this. And it doesn't feel so strange to them. And I think for dads, they're like, what happened? <laughs> I had put, oh, like, I, I planned for everything but this. And oh. so I think that the reason that Untangled has felt useful to dads in particular is that it sort of decodes what's going on for the girl, why it is not personal, why it is not a rejection of the dad, why it doesn't mean that the first 10 years of investment didn't somehow pay off into an adolescence of like ongoing connection. Um, I, I think that that's what it is. And it's normal adolescence, but there's not actually prior to Untangled, there just weren't a lot of books about the typical challenges of adolescence. There were a lot of books about when things have gone off the rails, when there's depression or anxiety or other very large concerns. But what Untangled allowed me to do was just to lay out, this is what's going to happen. And it's nobody's fault. It's your daughter working her way through these important transitions. And this is your part in it. So I think that's my theory about dads and Untangled and teenage girls. I'm so glad you said that. And it's really, really interesting that you said what you did because so I have 16, 14, eight and six and my eight-year-old my six-year-old still think i'm great and hilarious and all this they want to hang out and and my 14 year old you know and my 16 year old they're doing exactly what you just said like like i actually went down to my 14 year old i'm sorry my 16 year old's room yesterday i knocked on the door i was like what are you doing down here he's like uh just in my room i was like well you want to come up hang out with us and he's like no i'm just kind of chilling in here and just you know, hanging <laughs> out and i'm like okay and i went up to my wife and i'm like I was like, man, I was like, I feel like he doesn't want to hang out with us anymore. My wife was like, he's a teenager. I was like, yeah, I know. But like, you know, like he, he always did. And she's like, she goes, but that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it clicked for me. And I was like, oh yeah, wait, I did that too. 
but that's not like the lens that I view it through for some really weird reason as his dad. Like, I'm like, Oh wait, yeah, I did do that too. Like I automatically, like there's actually this part of me, which I'd love for you to speak about. I kind of take it personally. I don't know why even, but why, why do we do that? Well, I think we always do that. Like that's just the nature of being human as we sort of um, see things through the lens of why are you doing this to me? And one of the key things that I really try to lay out in Untangled is adolescence is not something that teenagers do to their parents. It is a very challenging developmental phase that they are working their way through. So the room example, um, that comes up actually in chapter one, which is about parting with childhood. And one of the things that has to happen is they have to move from being little kids to somebody who can leave and go to college. And that is a big leap in a very short space. And so what I argue in the book happens is that consciously or not, kids realize like, I'm moving out. I'm moving out actually within the next several years, not that long. I need to practice my independence. So I'm going to treat my room like it's an apartment and I'm going to live here. And my parents are going to be the landlords who inexplicably knock on my door from time to time. And I will be shocked when they do. And they will um, feel intrusive to me when I'm trying to live my apartment life. And we're going to do this for several years, and then I will move the rest of the way out. And if we think about that, that it would be strange if they hung out with us, hung out with us, talked to us, told us everything, and then one day we're like, oh, I'm off, right? So this is sort of the midway they do it. They leave by retreating to their rooms, and then eventually they leave, leave. And when we can see it through that lens, it gets to exactly what you're saying. It doesn't feel so personal. Like you can see them at work in the process of trying to get ready to go. And I think the key thing on this that we never want to forget is that their jobs are to become increasingly independent, and they have to do that while living with us, depending on us, having us feed them, having us drive them places. So for them to thread the needle of gaining independence while actually living under our roofs is not an easy thing to do. That makes total sense now. (laughs) <laughs> like even, even as you're taking me through like the whole apartment thing, like I'm actually mm-hmm. like, yeah, they, they're just sort of living in there. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they, they kind of watch their TV. Like my 14 year old has like this tiny, tiny, tiny mini fridge in there. Yep. He's got like his own like food in there and then he's got his drinks in there and his own mm-hmm. like, you know, snacks in there. And I'm like, I was like, yeah, it's kind of funny to see that because it is like his own space. That makes total sense. He's moving out, but he can't move out yet. So he's done it this way. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the best way for us as fathers Mm -hmm. to, I would say for us, embrace that change. Right. Mm -hmm. But also be the best for them during that phase. So it's a twofold question of how can we be the best? Like, how can we be, be okay with that is is the wrong word, but maybe Mm -hmm. know that it's not personal and, and realize that this is just a part of them growing up and then just be the best support for them. How do we do that? Well, so let's start actually with the not taking it personally, like how to really sort of get into a space where we're more neutral about what's happening. And so the way I laid out Untangled is I say there's seven developmental tasks that all teenagers have to do, kids of all genders, and they're the chapter titles. So it's parting with childhood, joining a new pack, like finding their people, harnessing emotions, contending with adult authority, planning for the future, entering the romantic world, and coming to care for themselves. And the way I set it up that, the way reason I set it up that way is for adults to see, this is all the work they're doing. These are all the things they're trying to get done. So when your kid is telling you, like, I don't agree with you anymore, or that thing you said, I don't think it's as true as you think it is, that is them contending with adult authority. That's a job the teenagers have. And so the more we can see it as like, they are doing these jobs, these jobs are necessary for adult development. Um, We get pulled into these jobs in ways that we don't always love, but they are doing these jobs and we want to see that job. If there's no friction with a teenager, that is grounds for concern. The more we can see it as tasks they are working their way through, the more neutral we are, the more supportive we can be. So that's one way to think about it. In terms of what they need from us, honestly, the best gift you can give a teenager is to lead a very boring middle-aged life. Their lives are pretty intense. Their lives are pretty disrupted. 
just because they're adolescents. Their emotions are very powerful. There's a lot going on. They're contending with a great deal of change in a very short period of time. And honestly, one of the kindest things is if you are pretty boring through that, you're, you know, around, you don't have a lot of your own drama, you're managing your own emotions pretty well. We want to try to create a contained and safe space for teenagers to work all of this out. And it does happen. You know, of course, people get divorced when they've got teenagers or people have to have big moves when they have teenagers. And that's not the end of the world. But we need to really be mindful that that's especially hard on young people when so much disruption is already underway just because they are teenagers. Wow. Okay. So you really piqued my curiosity on one thing. And that yeah. is um, my 16 year old is like the easiest teenager I've ever seen or known. Like mm -hmm. I even tell him, I was like, it's okay if you cause some trouble every now and again, mm -hmm. uh, it's okay if you disagree with me every now and again, like, mm -hmm. It's really okay. And and he yet he's very easy. What do I need to be concerned about? I'm very concerned. <laughs> you, probably, now. you probably don't need to be that concerned. But my hunch is well, first of all, it may be also that you're not particularly reactive. Like maybe he plays music that other parents would react to, or maybe maybe there's things that you, you take in stride that not all parents would. But I think I think that the rebellion can take a lot of different forms, some of which are very benign and very amusing. Um in my adolescence, the way I really stuck it to my mother was that I refused to eat cilantro. Okay. So <laughs> uh, my mom is a hell of a cook. I grew yeah. up in Colorado. So Southwestern food was a very big part of our life. Yeah. And, you know, cilantro, you can detect it in the tiniest increments. And so my grand rebellion was I was like, I hate cilantro. I will not touch it. I will not. Are you a super taster? I don't think I am, but the thing is, I also I don't have a problem with cilantro anymore. Like I don't, okay. it was entirely just to stick it to my mother. Okay, got so it. What I will say is, you see teenagers who really, for all sorts of reasons, don't need or want to do things that are more troublesome or could get or could really harm their own future prospects. Still find ways to give it to their parents. So I would keep an eye out for your boy to come up with something wonderful and creative and designed for you, but it may not look like the kind of typical naughty stuff we sometimes see in teenagers. Well said. Okay, cool. The reason I asked you about the super taster thing is because my wife is and there are certain mm. things, but cilantro is at the top of her list. So even if there's a tiny bit in something, it tastes like soap to her. Yep. So she's cilantro like, oh like God, soap. right. She's like, it tastes yep. like soap. And uh, <laughs> so she freaks out over that. I really want to talk about the finding the tribe, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I have boys, right? But uh, girls, the same thing. And I see, you know, a as their dad, would I, would I really have wanted to instill and knock on wood my first two. Um, it's been a successful journey so far. My, my, I have an eight and six year old, I, but I, I don't, I don't know what I don't know. And I don't know if we've helped them through this or if we've done something right, or they just done this on their own, but like both my 16 year old and my 14 year old, they have the personality of like, if you steal, you do drugs or drink, I want nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. Like literally nothing to do with you. And they'll cut a relationship. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, that's, that's cool. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very picky about who they circle themselves with. Right. Mm -hmm. Now we do things here, you know, the way we raise the boys, like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I say a lot, you know, Hey, relationships, good friendships are iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's, it's not necessarily always giving somebody, you know, a pat on the back for poor behavior or enabling really bad things and that kind of thing. Like, and you, you also have to have really good friends that, care about you and call you out on things in a very respectful way because they care, they love you. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, we, we, we've also had many talks with boys about, Hey, you might not be the one doing it, but if you're guilty by association, you are, that's mm -hmm. just the way it is. But I, I don't know what has worked and what hasn't, but is there ways that parents can influence like, Hey, this is, this is a good crowd. This is not such mm -hmm. a good crowd. So that's question number one is the other ways we can influence. My second question is if our kids are in a situation where we know like, oh man, this is not a good tribe for you to be around. Mm -hmm. I all, the story I tell myself is the more we push to say, Hey, that's not a good tribe, the more they're going to want to do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what that strategy looks like either. Okay. So the first question is sort of how do we steer kids towards the kind of peer group that we think is going to be best for them, you know, help them grow and thrive. 
And I think a lot of that is um, talking with our kids about our values, about the things that we think are important, but much more than that, kind of living our values. That um, I think, you know, one of my favorite sayings that applies to parenting, I saw on the inside of a Dove chocolate wrapper, which is don't talk about it, be about it. Yep. So, you know, it really, kids are watching us and watching how we live. And so if we surround ourselves with people who really share the values we have as a family and we really prize those relationships and we really live the values we say matter to us, my experience is kids kind of go and find people who re replicate that in their classrooms. They find those kids. You could say what your values are, and if you don't live them, you've actually made it worse than saying nothing at all, right? Because then kids are like, you're a big fat hypocrite. Like, you know, I don't believe you. So I think live your values, say your values, but more than anything, surround your kids with that experience, and they will replicate that when they leave the home. Um, if, however, you your kids, you know, they do, they can sometimes find themselves hanging out with or being drawn to kids who are very exciting, but also may be caught in things that you don't want your kid involved in. For me, the best way to approach anything like that with a teenager is to remember that all teenagers have two sides. All teenagers have a thoughtful, broad-minded, philosophical, and wise side. And all teenagers have an impulsive, um, troublemaking, you know, kind of risk-interested side. And the side that you talk to is the side that will show up for the conversation. So say you have to go pick up your kid from the police station, right? Like, let's just go worst case, worst case scenario. Your kid was out doing something with another kid who got caught. They all got scooped up together, and it's a bad situation. So you can show up at that police station and talk to the naughty side of the kid. What are you doing? What happened? How could you do this? And all you're going to get is a defensive reaction. Or you can be in the car on the way home saying, okay, this is not like you. I know you must be incredibly uncomfortable about what just happened. Talk to me about this and what occurred here. This is so not who you are. Where you're really speaking to the broad-minded, thoughtful, philosophical side of the kid, that's the side that'll show up for the conversation. And that's the side that will probably get themselves out of those bad friendships. I think what you just said here beautifully is creating this environment of psychological safety where they feel mm -hmm. safe to share with you versus like, the shame, blame, pain, and yep. guilt, like pointing the finger of, you know, like, why did you do this? What's wrong with you? What were you thinking? And of course, like, no one's going to open up to that. Um, even as you said that, like what I imagined for a moment was if my mom spoke to me like that, how even like I felt differently, like I, like I felt physically different in that conversation. Like I was like, there was a part of me that's like, I, I really want to tell you what's going on. Yep. Which is yep. like, I don't want to tell you anything. Yeah. That's, no, I mean, how cool. you speak to them determines how they're going to respond. And it's hard when they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing or they're acting yeah. provocatively. But I promise you, if you're, I mean, I have said to girls in my practice, like they'll describe some wild party and I'll say, what is a smart girl like you doing at a party mm -hmm. like that? You know, and then we're having a conversation about like why she's there. And, but I have to start with the, what is a smart girl like you? Um, that is the side I'm talking to. That is the side I am aligning with. And I am aligning with that side to make sense of the side that made the bad decision. Interesting. You've seen a lot of girls in your practice, obviously. Mm -hmm. correct? I do. Okay. I do. I take care of teenage boys too, but more girls. Yeah. Okay. I'd love to give men some strategies on some things that you've seen in your practice as far as like common themes that have impacted uh adolescent girls in a very negative way and you just keep seeing them. Mm -hmm. I also want to hear things that you've seen in your practice that have impacted girls in a very positive way that you've seen over and over again, that maybe men can walk away from this podcast being like, okay, I need to not do that. And I need to do more of this. So what mm -hmm. have you, what have you seen on both of those? So to the question of, you know, what is it the dads can do that whether they mean to or not actually does harm and what is it the dads can do that can really point things in the right direction. So I think that the key thing we want to remember is that kids care tremendously about what we as parents think about them and daughters care tremendously about what their dads think of them. And so it can absolutely happen that, you know, maybe a girl messes up a test and the dad who really wants to encourage her 
and means well says something like that's so dumb like why you you're you're like you why'd you get such a bad grade you know or something like that and he might really be meaning it in a way that is encouraging and has high expectations in her mind his mind but all she hears is my dad thinks i'm dumb right my dad thinks i didn't try like they will take it very personally What works much better, and it's actually back to what we were just saying, is when a kid messes up, is when we say this, you know, I know how capable you are. I know how much you care about your grades. I know who you are as a student. I'm sure you're confused about what happened here. I'm confused about what happened here. Can we try to make sense of it together? So anytime there's an opportunity to cast things in a positive light, cast things in an encouraging way, and you know, even when we tell girls like, oh, we're so proud of you or you did such a good job, you know, it's not unusual that they'll kind of roll their eyes or seem to slough it off. But I promise you, they care a lot about what we think. And so when we're giving feedback, we want to be very, very careful that we're always casting it with the highest expectations and the belief in how amazing they are and never shading it towards the negative. So I, I love that. Um there's something also that I want to point out to you. I'm sure you've probably been told this a million times. I don't know if you do this intentionally or if it's just the way you speak, but I've noticed when you give examples of this is not the best way to communicate with your kid, like, cause we'll be like, Hey, why did you do that? Mm-hmm. I notice, especially when you gave the example you did, um, and you were talking to the girl, like as, as the father, right? You slowed your voice down. You spoke more deliberately, gently. And there were very distinct pauses between some of the things you said, which made me feel calm. Hmm. And it, it just, it slowed me down a little bit. And as you were talking, I just noticed myself starting to think about what you were saying versus like just blasting me with whatever was that was on your mind, even if you, do you know what I mean? So the the question I'm asking is, is I've noticed with, with my boys, one of the things that we teach with, with our, with our guys is voice tone is very, very important, right? Voice tone can, I can literally use the exact same words and the meaning totally changes depending on my voice tone, but is it for you, is that purposeful? And if it, it, whether it is or isn't, I'd love for you to speak on the psychological impact on our voice tone to our kids. Absolutely. I don't know at this point if it's purposeful anymore. I mean, I think one of the things about being a clinician, right, is I've just spent nearly 30 years trying to get behavior change in my office. And all I have as a tool is my words, right? And so I'm thinking all the time, probably at this point, largely unconsciously, about how to not inspire a defensive response, right? That's all we're ever doing in therapy is trying to not get the defenses to show up. But on the topic of tone, so the thing I say all the time is, it's not the lyrics, it's the tune, right? And it's exactly what you just said. You can say the exact same words and it can come off as a hostile and accusatory, or you could say the exact same words and they could come off as curious and interested. It's all in the tone. And we really have to mind our tone if we want to get through to kids. And again, if we don't want to inspire defenses. And so The goal always is to make it clear to kids we're on their team. We're on their team. We want what they want. We want them to thrive. We want them to have freedom. We want them to have options. And so when we are calling questions or asking them what happened or asking them what went wrong, it's always in the service of trying to make more good things available to them eventually, not because we need them to do things for us, but because we want to be on the side of them having everything available that they want for themselves. I like that. And that's just, that's just so reassuring uh, that I think especially, and tell me if I'm wrong, I don't have girls, but is it, do you think it's even more important that if you have, you know, this masculine sort of deeper voice, you know, that can maybe if you're stern, it can sound like a bark that you're even more conscious of that with a daughter. I think so. I mean, and teenagers will say like, oh my God, my mom or dad was yelling at me. And if you actually had the play-by-play, very rarely was the parent raising their voice. You know, they can hear a very amplified sense of anger. The other thing I will say though about dads and teenage girls in particular is that 
dads can enjoy a little bit more freedom sometimes with their adolescent daughters because as teenage girls start to try to become separate from their parents, becoming separate from mom is a bigger job because you have so much more in common. And so it's pretty common in family life. And I will say this definitely happened with my older daughter, where if I asked her to do something, I would get a huge, a huge resistance. And so it became pretty common when she was sort of 12, 13, 14, where I would say to my husband, you need to tell her to clean her room. Yeah. You need to tell her we're leaving in 10 minutes. And so what I would say is, yes, sometimes dads can come off seeming a little bit like they're barking. But more often, I think dads are able to continue to have um, harder conversations with their daughters <laughs> through adolescence sometimes than moms can. And so it's a wonderful and important place that dads can play in this. I like that a lot. You know, um, as we wrap up here, there's one final thing that I really want to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. And it's this, it's the chapter on harnessing emotions. And I'll, 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 <clears throat> I'll, I'll share with you as I'm sure, you know, I'm not, I'm not sharing anything you haven't heard, but one thing I've seen over and over and over and over again, when it comes to a teenage girl from the lens of a father, and I would really love for you to give some clarity on what these girls are going through and what these guys, what the men are going through. So this is what I hear. Oh my God, the drama and the emotions for the love of God. It is a roller coaster ride. What is wrong with her? That's what I hear from dads, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure as you've, have you, have you, you have beautifully laid out these teenage girls in particular. I mean, I know boys too, but teenage girls, they are going through one heck of a journey on their own. And I'm sure these emotions are just, I mean, they, they are a roller coaster ride. But so tell us from a fatherly, like from a girl standpoint, what are they going through? And then how can we just be better equipped and better prepared for that? Because I think just men in general, when you come at us with a lot of emotion, it's just sometimes it's hard for us. That's why a lot of times I think, and you tell me if I'm wrong, you're, you're the doctor here, but when our women wives come to us with problems or they're venting, they really want to connect with us. They don't want us to solve the problem, but we want to, a lot of us just want to fix it. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to like take on so much emotion. We just want to fix it, take away their pain, take away our pain and just move on. Yep. But that's not what's needed, right? So how how can we be the best for them and what's going on with them? <laughs> so in terms of what's happening with teenagers, and this is why it's so hard to be a teenager, their brains are remodeling. They are becoming faster, more powerful, more efficient. And the brain remodels in the order in which it developed initially, which is from the more ancient regions in the back to the more sophisticated okay. regions in the front. Okay. The, the ancient regions house the emotions. Those get upgraded before the perspective maintaining systems in the front. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. this is why a 13-year-old girl and often a 14-year-old boy are very, very prone to meltdowns. When they become upset, their emotions become so powerful that they can override the whole system and take it down. Wow. Okay. So yeah. this is just a neurological gawky period that they go through. And that's, you know, we call it drama. We call it lots of things, but it's often well outside the adolescent's control. So on my website, and I'll, I'll it's drlisademore.com, drlisademore.com, I have a whole bunch of bookmarks, and one of them is called How to Manage a Meltdown, and I'm going to walk you through it. It's nine steps. You very rarely get past the third step, but the first step is listen without interrupting, and you do the steps until the meltdown stops, and often it'll stop after step two or three. So mm. listen without interrupting. Just let the person talk. And this also works for spouses and it also works for employees. It's not just teenage girls. And so just let them talk. And often, if you just really listen and let them say everything they need to say, people feel better. Wow. Okay. If you need to go on to step two, step two is offer empathy. Say, oh man, that stinks. Or I'm really sorry to hear that. Right? That's it. If you're still going, now you're on step three validate distress. Say, you know what? I think anyone in your shoes would feel upset. And, and teenagers especially need to hear this because the emotions are pretty upsetting to them too. And they worry that something's wrong with them. So I think to say, you know what? That's, that's pretty lousy. I can see why you're upset. Of course you're upset. That makes sense. Okay. If you are still going, step four is support coping, which is where you say, is there anything I can do that would make you feel better? Or is there anything I can do that wouldn't make you feel worse? Or what could you do to help yourself feel better? Like just sort of focus on like kind of comforting oneself. 
If you are still going, step five is to offer confidence, to say, you know, sort of non-dismissive confidence, say, you know, this is a very tough situation, but you're one tough cookie. I think you're going to get through it and I'm here for you. Step six, offer to help problem solve. Okay. So here's where problem solving comes in and you are right. People usually start at that and don't even offer solutions, offer to help problem solve. Say, do you want my help trying to think this through? So ask permission. Step seven, if they've said yes, (laughs) you divide the problem into two categories, things you can change and things you cannot change. Step eight is brainstorming solutions to the things that can change. Step nine is helping support acceptance of the things that cannot be changed. You almost never get this far through the process, but I will tell you, if you just listen, validate, empathize, usually that is all people need. Gosh, this was I feel like you literally just gave us the keys to the kingdom <laughs> for excellent conversations. I mean, um, and I'm thinking through this, especially there's such this protector mode in us fathers and, you know, men try to fix problems because we, we feel that it's noble and we just want to take away your pain. And we just, and then we feel that that's the best way to do it, even though that's like step six or seven. Right. And it's not, mm-hmm. and it's, it's just that the other person just needs to feel heard. Right. Yep. Seen, seen, heard and safe. Right. That's all um, people need most of the time. Yeah. And Brene, uh, Brene Brown has this beautiful quote where she talks about the difference between sympathy and empathy, which is sometimes the response is, gosh, I don't know what to say right now, but I'm just so glad you told me. And I've, <laughs> I've used that even so many times with my boys. Cause like, I've learned the hard way. I've been married for 19 years, been doing this work for almost 10 years. And I, I know not to solve problems. Yep. I know that, you know, steps one through three, I, I do know those things, but I also, I, I've never really understood it through the lens of a girl. So like, for instance, when a man tells me like, oh my gosh, the drama, the emotions and all this stuff, mm-hmm. for some reason, I've always thought that's something totally separate. Mm-hmm. And I've never heard anybody ever say from a, from a neurological, from a brain growth perspective, actually what's happening, but that makes total sense. And it helps if you really understand they don't have say over it. Their right. brains are so gawky that when they get upset, it is like a storm in their brain that has taken mm-hmm. over. And part of how you calm that storm is you let them just say it, just say everything that's upsetting to them. And that usually helps them bring things back under control. I have I have a probably a funny comparison as we wrap up the show. Okay. Here. So yeah. What you just told me was such gold to me, like just from a, from a brain perspective of like, oh my gosh, that makes total sense for me to think that my teenager would be any different. It's like thinking my six-year-old would come to me and it'll be like, so dad, I just want to let you know, I had a very bad day today. And this is what happened. This kid took away my pencil. I was very, very upset. And I just don't know what to do. I would never expect that out of him because his brain is not there yet. I expect him to be like, raw, you know, like raw emotion and primal and all this stuff. And, uh, but I've, I think, do you think the reason we view our teenagers is like, well, they're basically like a little adult. So I expect them Mm -hmm. to, to rise to the occasion and act like such. And maybe that's the lens we're looking them through. I think so. I also think it's pretty overwhelming when little kids have feelings, the feelings are really big, but the body is really small. Yeah. Right. And I think it's pretty intense to see a 13, 14, 15 year old feeling really overwrought by emotion. And that's a full size person. But here's a model that I think everyone should know. When psychologists talk about the developmental phases, we talk about early childhood, zero to five. Then we call the next period latency, ages six to 10. And what we mean is all of the intense emotionality of being a little kid, all the tantrum stuff, all of that stuff goes latent and becomes quiet. And it returns in adolescence around age 11. And so it's a very disrupted time developmentally. And what's so hard is usually families have enjoyed a period of relative quiet, right? The kid's been pretty easygoing, not that reactive. And so parents are like, this is going great. Like adolescence is going to be a cakewalk. And then they're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Whereas what we've always known is this is how you get the fuel for all of the development that needs to happen in a short space of time. But it's really, really amped up, especially at the beginning. And this is a key thing to know, that emotionality peaks right around 13 or 14 in adolescence and actually starts to go down from there. 
And and I, I I would love to take out billboards. One that says adolescence begins at 11 because nobody expects that. They're always right. shocked when their 11-year-old acts like a teenager. And another that says emotionality peaks around 13 or 14 because I think people think like, holy moly, if this is how we're starting the teenage years, like <laughs> this is going to be a real ride. And what we can that. reassure people is you know, 16, 17, 18-year-olds tend to actually be more easygoing. But there's a period that's pretty intense. Gosh, this has been awesome. Oh, have, thank you. I have loved it. I mean, I've got boys, but man, this makes even like you were saying before we started recording was is that this makes so much sense for boys too. Um, I feel like I could talk to you all day, even though I know we're out of time. This was awesome. Um, I would love to have you back because I know you have a new book coming out in February um, to do. talk about that. I do. And, I have a book called The Emotional Lives of Teenagers. It's an all genders book. It's actually available for sale now, even though people oh, won't get it to their homes until February, but it is on sale now. And I have a podcast that comes out every week where my co-host Rena Ninen and I answer all sorts of parenting questions. It's called Ask Lisa, The Psychology of Parenting. Well, we're going to have everything in the show notes. We're going to have your your previous books, Untangled, your other books, and then your book coming out, as well as your podcast, your website. Uh, what I'd also like to do is put a link in there for the for the meltdown steps because oh my gosh, sure. like I wish I would have known that like 16 <laughs> years ago. Um, but this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. This was so cool. You bet. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Gentlemen, you can find all the show notes if you want to connect with Dr. Lisa, her podcast, her books. Just head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash 401 for the show. Again, the dadedge.com forward slash 401. Dr. Lisa, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. You Take bet. Care. Gentlemen, go out. Live legendary. Take care.